Welcome. 85% of you are not yet subscribed. Be sure to like and subscribe for more scary stories. Or I will come for you. Story number one. My local internet cafe is not much of a sight to behold. I think that's what may have contributed to its shutting down for a few months back in June. The exterior was reminiscent of an abandoned shack, with its dilapidated appearance and broken windows. However, after they cleaned up the inside, I definitely saw some improvements. Sparkly clean tile floors and beautiful mahogany countertops filled the cafe with a sense of ease and elegance. I always got plenty of work done in there, so the shop's grungy look never bothered me much. But it was very nice to have a change of scenery once the cleanup was done. I was probably the only regular at the cafe venturing in on an almost daily basis. Plenty of other folks cycled in and out, but nary a familiar face would show up. This was fine since I only went there to edit my vlogs on the website. On occasion, striking up a conversation with someone recognizable was not on the agenda. I was there for some much needed peace and quiet, not small talk. Though I did have Wi-Fi at home, the thin walls there did little to muffle my father's drunken ramblings. The cafe was my escape from the unwanted noise. I strolled in on a Saturday morning, just five days after the grand reopening. I was feeling pretty groggy, still recovering from a cold I caught during the week. The humid August air didn't help matters. Because of this, I decided to grab a coffee before getting my things set up. I walked across the glimmering newly replaced floors and heard them squeak under my sneakers. I laughed a little to myself, almost tempted to start turning in place just to hear the sound a few more times. No, I told myself, grow up. I ordered my coffee and took a look around the room while I waited for it. I took a mental note of how many faces were in the cafe with me. I was surely going to grab a quiet little table in the corner away from these strangers. Small iced, regular, the barista held out my coffee and straw. Thanks, I said plainly. I threw down a couple of quarters as a tip and strolled over to the table I wanted. I spent the next few hours clipping and slicing my videos from the previous day. I was doing a week-long series about the gym I go to, workout tips, and some comedy bits with my buddy Jake, who works at the front desk. I found myself laughing out loud over a protein shake skit we had done and may have drawn some attention to my little corner of the room. Though the staring eventually subsided, I felt it best for me to leave, as I had been there much longer than usual. I reached down and unplugged my laptop charger, and that's when my hand brushed up against something. Confused, I took a look under my table to investigate. A 16-inch black bag sat just beyond where my feet were settled. It had pockets and a shoulder strap, as well as an abundance of dust coating the leather. Holy crap, someone must have left their laptop behind. At first, I was going to do the right thing. I very easily could have handed it over to the barista and called it a day. I guess maybe that would have been the smart thing to do. However, a mixture of curiosity and stupidity overcame me, keeping me from being honest. Instead, after picking up my own things, I swung the mystery bag over my shoulder and swiftly exited the cafe. Stupid. I pulled into my family driveway at about noon, the hot summer sun beaming down onto my front lawn. My father was doing his usual half-ass inspections of the plants in the garden, beer, can in hand. I tried to get into the house without a word to him. He stopped me just as I opened the storm door. Hey, why are you in such a hurry? He asked, taking a swig of his drink. I don't have time. Important website business, I replied. Well, well, don't stop on my account. But you just stopped me, I thought to myself. I pushed through the front door, passing my sleeping mother on the couch, and darted upstairs to my room. 
I slammed my door shut hard behind me and locked it immediately. I tossed my belongings and newly found goods onto the bed and kicked my shoes clear across the room. I was excited to dig into this lucky hall. Carefully and slowly, I unzipped the top of the bag and pulled it open. I gasped a little to myself. Despite the appearance of the bag, the contents were no joke a shiny, brand new looking laptop nestled inside. I pulled it out and observed it. It was certainly nicer than my basic 500 gig AP from a big box store. I couldn't believe what I was holding. I flipped it open and began feeling the keys and monitor. It was in mint condition. I had to be the luckiest guy in the world. Everything was there. Charger, wireless, mouse. I even found a bag of screen wipes at the bottom. I dug into the pockets, curious as to what treasure I might find in there. What I found was a cell phone. Nothing special, an Android phone. It was still powered on and had no lock screen. Exploring further, I noticed there were no texts, and I only saw one recent call to an out-of-state number. Being into electronics, I went into the settings to see what kind of operating system it had. It was vastly out of date on software and still set in some variation of the Lollipop OS. That's all right, I thought. I could still flip it for a quick 10 bucks or so. I placed it on the bed next to the laptop and sat for a moment, trying to take in what was in front of me. This was such a great find, but I needed to power on the laptop and see what I was working with. To my excitement, there was no login screen. I was in immediately after booting it up. I was never as into laptops as I was with phones. But I could tell right away I was not working with your standard stock operating system. This thing resembled more of a modded setup that I'd seen kids working with back in high school. I couldn't name it off the top of my head. Luckily, it was simple enough to navigate. I set it up with my Wi-Fi and dived right into the file storage to get an idea of whose computer I had. I was disappointed for just a few moments. Later, I did find a folder labeled X. Inside was one JPEG titled Y1. Intrigued, my stomach did a little flip as I opened the image. I was puzzled by what I found. It was a screenshot from a website, a post in some forum from a user named Anon with nothing but a phone number listed and zero replies. Underneath the list was a tagline, you know who you are. Scanning the image for an answer, I noticed the address bar for the site. It seemed to be a nonsense string of characters followed by a onion extension. Onion. Wasn't that a parody news site or something? I wasn't too sure, but I decided to dig a little deeper. I clicked on the little X at the top, taking me back to the desktop. That's when I noticed another folder. This one was labeled Pics which stirred up some more thrill in my bones. Yes, I cheered to myself. This would more than likely reveal the owner's identity. I became disappointed as I clicked through the pictures. There was no human life, just shots of different places and scenery. This included a dark image of a barber shop, a path in the woods somewhere, and even someone's garage. What really caught my eye was the last pick. It was the cafe. My stomach started doing acrobatics now, my heart racing. Why were there random pictures in this thing? Why was there a screenshot of a message board with a list of phone numbers? The files just weren't adding up for me, but I hatched a half-baked plan. I didn't know if it was going to end the mystery, but I couldn't help but pry. I pulled up the piece with the phone numbers, grabbed the Android phone, and dialed the first number at the top of the list. After only two rings, I was greeted with silence. Strange, I thought, but I pressed on and dialed the next number on the list, this time around five times before I got a generic inbox greeting with the phone number listed. Interesting, 
but I hung up before I heard the beep. I grew bored of dialing the random numbers and decided to take a break, putting the laptop and cell phone away for a little while. I knew I'd come back to it later. Once the evening rolled around, I waited for my parents to go to bed and fixed myself up a snack. This was pretty much a nightly routine of mine. I clicked on the TV as I usually did and settled on the first news channel I scrolled to. This is when things took a turn for the weird. A breaking news story was displayed on the screen, one from the next town over. Young Barber, age 25, found murdered at work. I shook my head. That sucks. A female news reporter was on the scene outside the barber shop where it took place. Wait a second. I couldn't believe my eyes. A barber shop? It was the same one from the picture on the laptop. I was sure of it. I put my plate down on the coffee table and raced upstairs to grab the computer. I booted it up, clicked on the folder of pictures, and then the photo in question. I ran back downstairs with the laptop in hand and held it up to a TV screen. Yep, it was definitely the barber shop. Wow, what were the chances of that? I finished watching the news story and began feeling tired. I was about to ready myself for bed, so I grabbed the remote. Just after I grabbed my attention before I could hit the power button, cold murder in local forests. This one was also nearby just over the bridge in the opposite direction. This world is terrible, I thought. I hadn't seen two stories like that back to back in a long time. That's when it hit me. I scrolled over to the picture of the woods in the same folder. Then I waited to see if the new story included the location of the homicide on video, though I didn't get anything solid to compare it to. I was definitely getting weird vibes first a barber shop now a forest. I had to be grasping at straws, though, right? And I decided it was bedtime. I had a pretty restless night of sleep, tossing, turning, and kicking my covers at the foot of the bed. It was hot and humid, and I kept waking up with the sweats. Needless to say, I was in dire need of a coffee the next morning. It was probably smart to leave the strange laptop at home grabbing my equipment as I headed out the door and drove rather quickly to the cafe, eyelids still heavy. I got my regular coffee and sat down at my favorite booth in the corner. Only one other person resided in the building, apart from the baristas at work. It was nice and quiet and felt peaceful, a good contrast from my evening snack and sweaty night of interrupted rest. Still, my mind couldn't help but wonder about the web address from the screenshot. I found myself rolling through it in my thoughts. What was the Onion Domain all about? Why did the web address make no sense, something like code in flux with random numbers and symbols after it? This was meaningless to me, and I decided it was time to do some research. I couldn't recall the exact website, but I remembered the onion extension. So I started from there and was immediately blown away. Apparently, it pertains to web addresses not reachable on normal servers. It takes you through something called Tor and is used for some pretty shady activities. I guess it involves what's called the dark web. I'd heard a little about this before and I was beginning to feel sick. The websites on the wiki were pretty revolting, to say the least, nothing I would ever want to be involved in. The worst part, I was beginning to think the laptop I found was used solely to access this part of the internet. I couldn't bear the thought of being in possession of it any longer. I had to do something. I stormed out of the cafe, ready to spring into action, when I was stopped by a tap on my leg. I looked down to see a homeless man looking back at me in a black, tattered leather jacket, sitting up against the front of the building. His face looked rough, complete with a badly shaven beard and cracked lips. He looked miserable. He held out a small plastic cup, looking up at me with desperation in his eyes. Spare change, sir. 
I hesitated. Dude, don't got any cash. He begged some more and reached out, grabbing my pant leg. No, get away from me. I kicked his hand away. The guy looked upset. His eyes were actually watering a little bit, and I did feel a little bad. But damn, don't grab me. That's when this guy did the strangest thing. He took out a phone and started taking pictures of me. What are you doing? I asked, confused as hell. He didn't answer. All I could do was run to my car and leave as fast as possible. What was this guy's deal? I called my friend Peter on my way home. I knew he would have some more insight into this whole thing. I was hoping I could bring him to my house and have him wipe the computer clean. Then I could sell it to a random Yahoo and be done with this whole misadventure. Once I picked up my friend, I sped back to my house and showed him what I had found in the cafe. He was blown away. This thing is lethal, he exclaimed. Looks pretty customized, honestly. Yeah, I noticed that, but take a look at this. I clicked through the photos, showing him the ones, and I compared them to the local news stories. So you think this laptop has some connection to the murders? I don't know, man, but I think there's something fishy going on here. He shrugged and took over the mouse for a moment. Where are the pictures and phone numbers? I pointed to the file storage. Yep, click there and bingo. Peter stared intensely at the list and address bar in the screenshot. He also checked the file description and saw the screenshot originated from the laptop it was taken from within the device. My hairs were at attention all up and down my skin. So, you tested these numbers out? Yeah, with this phone, I handed him the cell phone that came in the bag with the laptop, and he scanned through it rapidly. Definitely a trap phone. Something bought as a burner, possibly for some sort of business tasks. Should we try another phone number? I nodded and pointed to one just below the phone numbers I'd tested out. He dialed it in and threw it on speakerphone so we could both listen. It rang and rang and didn't stop ringing. So we hung up after the eighth ring. Peter looked at the phone funny, then said, I honestly don't know what's up with all of this. Do you want me to just factory reset everything? Yeah, I mean, is that gonna take care of my problem? Not sure, but I think I'd like to have some fun with this before we call it a day. I gave him a look, a glance of disagreement. I didn't think that would be in our best interests. Come on, what could go wrong? You could even film it. This could go viral. Well. I'm not gonna vlog me hanging around with a stolen laptop. So just do what you got to do and move on. Peter smirked, looked at the screen again, and then dialed another number from the list. Again, we got nothing this time, just another generic voicemail greeting. He continued on to the next phone number. Halfway through dialing, he stopped. His eyes were scanning the screen. Um. His face was now as white as a ghost. What? Why'd you stop? He didn't say a word. All he did was start dialing another number. That's when I felt it. My pocket was now vibrating. I go so loud that I flinched. I reached down and pulled out my phone and answered. I held it up to my ear. Peter, I said through the receiver, looking at my visibly shaken friend across the room from me. This is messed up, he responded through the burner phone. I ended up driving Peter home shortly after he handed the phone over and told me he wanted to leave and take everything. He left the laptop with me and told me he'd rather not mess with it. We decided to meet up at the cafe and drop it back off right next morning. We'd wake up early and hopefully be the first ones in. However, I missed my alarm. Apparently, I'd also missed 10 calls from Peter. I opened my last messages and noticed the four texts he'd sent me. Dan, I had to get going. I'm fast. I had already packed up everything the night before, so all I really had to do was throw on a t-shirt, shorts, and head to the cafe. 
As I turned the corner to where the cafe was, I had to hit the brakes pretty quickly. What I saw on the road was nothing but cops and ambulances. There were roadblocks set up on either side of the ambulances, and the cafe was barricaded. Martin D., I was thinking out loud. This was crazy. There were people with their hands over their faces, looking scared and sad. I pulled over into the grocery store parking lot across the street and then walked over to the scene to get a closer look. I assumed Peter was doing the same. I ended up in a crowd of onlookers next door, looking at the scene before us. There was blood splattered on the front doors of the cafe and some papers, along with other belongings, strewn about. More blood covered the ground. Jesus, this was a damn massacre. I could hear the people beside me whispering to each other about what was going on. They were talking about a possible serial killer. One woman said to her friend, the kids were about to walk in and suddenly bullets came in from over there. No one saw who fired the shots. A guy filled in his wife about what he witnessed. I was too curious to just be craning my neck from back there. I needed a closer look. I peered over at the cops, who were busy questioning a barista by the ambulances. I crept past the barricade slowly and slipped past a few other baristas and made my way to a second ambulance by the other barricade. The stretcher was now in full view, but I couldn't tell who was in it. I decided to kneel down beside the ambulance and hopefully catch some conversation between the MPs. I took out my phone and started recording. We lost him. He wasn't hanging in there much when we got here, but I was hoping. Jan, it's not your fault. You saved the girl. You can't save them all, you know. But then he showed. Could I have heard him talk before he left? You know, he told me his name was Peter. My hands jumped up over my mouth as I let out the weirdest sound. It was a gasp combined with a grunt of disbelief. No, it couldn't be. Yeah, the other EMT said. We have his information already. Guess he was an IT guy for a local business. Smart kid, early 20s. I stumbled back a bit on my heels, dropping my phone in the process. I bumped into something solid behind me and stood up quickly. I turned around and saw the same homeless guy from the other day. My face was still contorting from the information I'd just received from my eavesdropping. He was just staring at me, stoic. He didn't even react to me bumping into him. He was glaring at me from behind an unchanging expression. I couldn't help it. I booked it across the street to my car. I could feel tears forming in my eyes, twitching in the wind from my open driver's side window. Why did I have to wake up so late? Maybe Peter would have been spared from whatever this was, a drive-by, an assassination of some kind. My head was dizzy, my heart was hurting, but I was beginning to make some connections. The pictures on the computer, the phone numbers, the murders, everything. I was getting an idea as to what it was I was dealing with. The stuff about the dark web. The strange laptop, the phone numbers, I arrived home heartsick as hell. My friend was murdered today, and I couldn't stop it. Maybe if I had never grabbed the computer from the cafe, he'd still be alive. Maybe if I hadn't been so stupid, I could have handled this whole thing differently, and he wouldn't be dead right now. To top it all off, I realized I left my phone at the bloody scene. I groaned and threw my head back into the driver's seat. Now what? Well, the phone is near some cops and the MPs. Maybe if I call, they'll believe I dropped it before they got there, and I won't get in trouble. I reached back and grabbed the burner phone out of my bag and started to dial my phone number when I suddenly had a thought. If the phone numbers we dialed somehow had something to do with the murders, that must mean... I grabbed the laptop out of the bag, my heart racing and body profusely sweating in fear. This whole thing was unreal. The fact that I was right in the middle of it was even worse. 
I clicked on the folder of pictures of scenery from earlier again. My eyes scrolled across the pictures of the barbershop, then the forest. Finally, my eyes got to the picture of the cafe. Yes, the phone numbers and these locations had to have somehow been tied together, but I didn't know how. Why was this happening? I was about to leave the folder, but then a smaller thumbnail at the end of the list of pictures caught my eye. I hovered over the cursor and opened it up with some cloud service. The image was revealed. My jaw dropped in horror, a picture of my house. I was looking at an image of my front yard and home. I hadn't noticed this before. Why hadn't I noticed this before? Over in the top corner was a link that once opened up the full cloud folder from some email made up of more gibberish characters. This folder contained more pics pics that were very different from the others. No way, I shouted out loud. My face contorted in anger and fear. Once pictures of me, pictures of me looking directly at the camera, others of my car. The last ones were of me sneaking into the crime scene at the cafe. That guy, that homeless looking guy from the other day, and behind the ambulance. I have his laptop. He was watching me. How did he tie in with these murders? My silent tirade was interrupted by the sudden sound of a jingle to my right. The phone was ringing in my passenger seat. I picked it up and peered at the phone number. I couldn't handle this anymore. I couldn't take it. It was my own phone number. Grudgingly, I decided to swipe it onto the call. Who, who was this? I stammered. A gravelly voice answered from the other end. Spare some change, sir? Story number two. I will admit, first off, that I have heard a lot of these deep web, dark web stories, and have always called bullshit. However, a close friend of mine swore that she had been to this place and that she had seen some really messed up things. Some she would talk about, others she refused. She said some of the things she had seen would haunt her for the rest of her life. I should have just let it go at that, but I wanted to believe that she was making it all up and that there was no such place. But I was the one that was wrong. You know the drill by now. I downloaded Tor Onion and found the hidden wiki. I had been warned about some of the links and how they can trick you into some really crazy and horrible things. I clicked a few. They were mostly sex meetups, escort requests, drug deals. Needless to say, I was really starting to think I was right and that the deep web was just an easy way to make shady deals that couldn't be traced. It was lame, tame, and a little bit boring. I looked around for something remotely interesting until I found the link the Night Watchman. Okay, this could be interesting. I was thinking it might be some guy telling creepy stories or walking around a sleepy town at night or something. What greeted me was a flat black page with three videos blown up to cover the space sitting side by side in a line. They were paused and on each of them was a picture of different people. The first one had a family of four, mom, dad, and two little girls. The second was a couple with the female being very obviously pregnant. The third was just one woman and her dog, a cute black lab with a white streak over his left eye. Before I could study them for too long, a voice came through. It was male, but slightly distorted so I couldn't really hear what he actually sounded like. Here is what he said. Good evening. Tonight, the night watchmen have brought you three unique households. Each of them lives different lives, believe different things, have different future plans. He stopped here and cleared his throat. For this next part, it sounded like he was smiling. Watch each video and then choose one. I really didn't understand the point of this task, but honestly, my interest was piqued. I was curious about where this was going. I clicked the first video. There wasn't much to it. It showed the family in their home, 
skipping through moments of them watching TV playing in the backyard, having supper, the parents putting the kids to bed, starting to make love. It cut off there, thank God. I was starting to feel like a weird creep. I was seeing a part of people's lives that were meant for only them. I reluctantly clicked the next video. I was transported into the home of a young couple getting ready to start a family. It skipped through to them in the baby's room, hugging and generally looking excited. They ate salads at the kitchen table, went through mail, looked through baby books and magazines, watched a show on TV, and then went to bed, snuggling up together. This one was so sweet, I couldn't help but smile at what I had seen. However, I was still a voyeur in their personal moments. I had gone through the others. I figured it was only right to watch the last one. This one was of a single woman living with just her dog. She was a bit of a slob. She had dishes piled up, laundry on a love seat in the living room, and trash that was overflowing. The other two had been pretty tidy, the family having some toys and laundry lying around. A couple with a very clean house. I wondered if there was a point to that, since it did show these aspects in the videos. Anyway, the woman seemed lonely. She watched a lot of TV, ate a half gallon of ice cream, checked her cell phone every few moments, obviously hoping for a call or text, played fetch with her dog, fed him, and then went to bed, taking her phone with her. She began to masturbate and I began to feel incredibly awkward. Thankfully, this one ended there as well. I waited to see what was next. The videos reset and went back to the stills of each one again. The voice came back over and said, now that you have seen, which will you choose? I sat there and watched, praying that someone else was here watching this too and would choose, but nothing happened for a few minutes. The videos disappeared, and another three videos began playing simultaneously. These turned my stomach. There were three tall men. I assumed they were men by what character I could catch. They each wore the same clothing, black shirt, pants, boots, and a long black trench coat that dangled around their ankles. To top it all, they each wore a large, wide-brimmed black hat. Have you decided? Which one will you choose? The voice chimed in over the obviously live feed. Death comes on swift wings for our ill-fated friends. You must choose one. That is how the game goes. He thought this was a game. I was horrified. Was I really supposed to choose who died here and who survived? It was ridiculous, and I went to close the page down. Calmly, the voice began again. Before you close us down, you should know that if you do not choose one of the three shown here, your family will be next. I was startled by his declaration, but figured that he was just trying to scare me. He was doing a really good job, truthfully. Anna, he said. My heart skipped a beat. He said my name. Now I was officially terrified. I just wanted this to stop. Anna, dear sweet Anna, I know it's a difficult choice, but it must be made. Please, if you will, direct the Night Watchmen to their chore. The original videos came back up and I knew that meant it was time for me to pick someone to die. Maybe it is just a horrible joke that some hacker and his friends like to play on unsuspecting deep web surfers. I stated out loud. It was more to make me feel better than anything, even though my heart was still pounding. I looked at the people again. There was a family there, children. I couldn't choose them. Then there was the expecting couple. I couldn't do this. It was too much. Choose the normally calm voice barked at me. Choose now. I jumped and looked at the last one. It was the lonely woman with a dog for a companion. She had the least to lose. She was alone without kids or a husband. It wasn't okay, but I quickly clicked her video. Very well. So, 
shall it be? The voice was calm and smooth once again. The videos of the Night Watchmen came back up. Night Watchmen, a choice has been made. You may attend to your work. I watched in horror as two of the Watchmen began walking toward the houses in front of them, and the third one walked away from a house. I was confused. I chose the lonely woman, but her Watchman was walking away. He disappeared into the night, and the feed cut off. The other two videos grew bigger and took up the screen. What's going on? What's going on? Was all I could say. The two watchmen that it showed each effortlessly broke into the houses. I was biting my bottom lip so hard it bled. The feeds walked along with them as they each silently roamed through the houses. One watchman walked into the setup baby room and looked around gingerly, then made his way across the hall to the other bedroom. The other watchman walked slowly down the hall, seemingly trying to decide which room to enter. He chose the children's room. I looked over to the first one. He stood at the foot of the sleeping couple's bed, holding a huge machete. He walked to one side and began swinging wildly. There were screams so loud and frightened that I felt like I might pass out or throw up. I looked over to the other video. Reluctantly, the watchman stood in the children's room, right in the center of the pink bunk bed. He also brandished a machete. I was terrified, traumatized. What had I just witnessed? What had I just done? My mouth felt dry. My head was spinning out of control. My heart felt like it might burst from my chest. After several hours, I decided to check my computer and hope that the nightmare I had witnessed was gone. There was nothing. Days later, I was checking my email when I stopped and recoiled in horror. There was an email from the night watchman. I finally opened it. I really don't know why. Maybe I was hoping they would tell me I had been punked or something. Instead, it was just a few large words on an otherwise white background. Jenna thanks you for excluding her from a night watchman fate. We thank you for your choices too. We truly enjoyed our encounter with you. Come play again anytime. Attached was a picture of the lonely woman walking her dog in the park, still looking down at her phone. I will never, ever access the deep web again. Story number three. In 2004, a video was found on the deep web that caused quite a stir on various user forums. At the time, the website itself took an incredibly long time to load as many sites accessed through Tor notoriously did and still do. The background of the site was simply white, and there were four videos listed one beneath the other without any thumbnails. These videos were downloadable and simply titled Farm 1, Farm 2, Farm 3, and Farm 4. The videos were said to contain malicious software that would make it impossible to close the program used to open the file. It was reported that the video would continue to loop without stopping if opened. There are various reports about each of the different videos, but amidst the different reports, there was a universal agreement that the videos were, well, very disturbing to say the least. The first video, titled Farm One, had an old camera placed in the corner of what appeared to be some kind of factory farm with a dimly lit interior. The video was three minutes long and of very poor quality, just showing pigs wandering around in the dark. In the background, there appeared to be several people standing against the furthest wall of the large enclosure, but due to the poor quality of the video, it was difficult to make out any defining features. There was no audio attached to this video. In Farm 2, a South African flag is visibly hung from one of the walls. The quality was marginally better this time, with some limited audio that consisted of a loud humming sound. Pigs were reportedly wandering around in circles within their pens. The video lasted for around four minutes this time, and during the last 30 seconds of the video, the pigs appeared to panic and swarm in a circle, as if something had startled them. 
A large object could be faintly seen landing in the pen, but was nearly impossible to identify. Farm 3 and Farm 4 were the most disturbing of the videos. Farm 3 lasted for around 4 minutes, and Farm 4 lasted for around 10. The camera seemed to have moved into a smaller tiled area that resembled a public restroom with various brown stains on the walls and the floor. In the room were three slaughtered pigs spread across the floor, their heads dismembered. The camera was placed at foot level for this video. Someone in Wellington boots could be seen walking in front of the camera and circling the three corpses. It appeared at first that these pigs were dead. However, the corpses appeared to be sewn shut along each of their underbellies with visible stitching. Although the audio was obscured by the humming sound from the previous video, muffled noises could be heard along with visible twitching from within the bellies of the pigs. Towards the end of the video, there appeared to be something resembling the fun of a child stepping into the room. But again, this is difficult to see in the video, which stopped as the man kicked the underbelly of one of the twitching pigs. The final video, Farm 4, was the most disturbing of the series. There are several naked figures lying across a wall with dismembered pig heads forced over their own, presumably from the bodies of the pigs in Farm 3. It was claimed that two men and one woman were chained to the far wall from the first room. They were described as visibly shaking and appeared to be frantically moving their heads from side to side, as if trying to remove the animal's heads from their own. Again, there were muffled noises, allegedly coming from behind the pig heads, and the victims were described as having various cuts and bruises across their arms, and even some form of a brand on each of their chests. Disgustingly, in the case of the woman, it appeared to have been directly placed at the center of her right breast. The scene cuts out for a brief moment, and the camera has been moved to foot height once more at the entrance of one of the pens. The captives are on their hands and knees, looking towards the camera. They remain still until prompted to move by the man who wore the Wellington boots. He appears to be yelling at them and violently pointing towards the adjacent room from Farm 3. But there was no audio in this segment of the video and his face is impossible to see due to the poor quality of the video and the cap over his head. The camera cuts out for a brief moment, and the victims are now stood in the pig pen and appear to be dancing and waving their arms and wallets. Directly looking down at the camera, the camera cuts out again, and the victims are said to have been continuously crawling around in a circle on their hands and knees, similar to the pig seen in Farm 2. There was another cut, and the two men are now standing in the pen, while a woman remains on her hands and knees, looking down towards the floor. The men from Farm 3 appear to be pointing at the two men and the woman with frenzied motions. The two men appear reluctant to comply with the man until he starts pointing at the adjoining room once more, presumably from Farm 3. The men then reluctantly begin to touch their privates, and one can only speculate what happens next. The video cuts for the final time, and the trio are crawling into a circle once more. Eventually, the woman stops and appears to break down crying. The two men also stop and appear to try and comfort her by patting her on the back and attempting to whisper although all that can be seen are the pig heads moving closer towards hers. The man from Farm 3 then comes over and starts frantically pointing at the adjoining room once more. The victims seem to panic and start moving with urgency and desperation. The man from Farm 3 disappears into the adjoining room, brings out the headless corpse of one of the pigs, takes out a butcher's knife, and begins to repeatedly stab the underbelly of the pig. A muffled scream can be clearly heard over the humming audio. This came directly from the female victim, as she and the other two men desperately try to climb over the pen towards the man. The video then abruptly ends before repeating itself once more.
Allegedly, the authorities were informed of the videos, and many different farms across the region were checked for any possible evidence of the activities shown in the videos. There were no special characteristics that could point to the building, as the architecture was common. Due to the annual number of missing people in the region and limited resources, the case was essentially closed and labeled as an elaborate hoax. The videos and Onion Link are rumored to still be around to this day. This is The Curator. I hope you've enjoyed today's scary stories. Until next time.